All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us again for uh, another um, session in the Certificate Program in Practice-Based Research Methods. Uh, today's session is titled Lessons About Complexity from the uh, a PCOR IBHPC Pragmatic Trial. Uh, this virtual session is facilitated by the Clinical Directors Network and the N Squared a Network of Virtual um, Training Series funded by the AHRQ. Uh, this gives you live access to the um, archived um, sessions and to the live sessions as, as today. Um, the certificate program in practice-based research methods um, was developed and partnership uh, with the support of eight AHRQ funded PBRN centers of excellence. Again, uh, as always here, just some housekeeping. If you have any questions, double click on CDN Help or Clinical Directors Network. Um, the chat box is located below. If you have any questions, you can type it in there also. Um, please, uh, if you're not speaking, please make sure to keep your phone on mute. Um, uh, I iterate, uh, please just make sure you keep your phones on mute. At this time, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Uh, Jim Werner, who's going to introduce today's speakers. Great. Thank you, Vladimir. Welcome, everybody. i um, excited to introduce our speakers uh, for our presentation on lessons about complexity from the PCORI IBH PC Pragmatic Trial. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Roger Kessler. Dr. Kessler is a health psychologist practicing in family medicine for over 20 years, and he's also an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Vermont, and is associate chair for research and evaluation in the Doctor of Behavioral Health Program at Arizona State University. He's co-principal investigator on the IBH-PC comparative effectiveness trial supported through PCORI, which evaluates the outcomes of co-located and integrated models of behavioral care as part of primary care, uh, also called integrated behavioral health and primary care. So he'll be talking a lot about that today. Uh, that's a topic that I'm particularly interested in. I know a number of our fellows are doing behavioral health related uh, research, so uh, I think this is very relevant. Dr. Kessler has designed, implemented, and evaluated the effectiveness of many integration projects in family medicine and, and in other specialties. Um, as well as three integrated Vermont Fletcher uh -huh. Allen Healthcare patient-centered medical home integration pilots. He also um, has expertise in practice-based research as he's director of the Collaborative Care Research Network, which is a sub-network of the National Research Network, uh, the NRN, which is supported by the American Academy of Family Physicians. So thank you for being with us, Dr. Kessler. Uh, next, um, uh, presenting with Dr. Kessler, is Dr. Connie Van Egan. Uh, Dr. Van Egan is assistant professor in general internal medicine at the University of Vermont. Her research teaching and outreach interests are in health services, specifically the planning and implementation of operational change in healthcare organizations. Um, Dr. Van Egan has a 25 year history in helping frontline healthcare providers and staff redesign processes. She educates healthcare professionals in quality improvement, strategic planning, through the use of the Toyota production system concepts and methods known as Lean. She facilitates healthcare teams and structural improvement processes, and she's authored two implementation toolkits that change primary care processes to improve patient outcomes. So um, welcome, Dr. Kessler and Van e Dr. Van Egan. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we uh, will ask the fellows to uh, put, respond to any questions you may have in the chat box. And as the, the uh, presentation progresses, fellows, please um, ask questions during the course of the presentation in the chat box. And we, we will uh, try to address those uh, as quickly as we can. Um, again, as, as uh, Vladimir mentioned, please put your phones on mute if you're not speaking. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Kessler and Dr. Van Egan. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you and to do this presentation. I would just ask if anything gets into the chat box while I am concentrating on the presentation and not responding to it, if someone can just give me a cue to say that there's something in the chat box that I should be attentive to, I'd be happy to do that. 
We'll certainly so, do that. Thank you. So the reason that we are having this conversation is that in the fall, we were awarded a five-year application uh, project to evaluate a particular research question, which we will get into um, in a bit. And um, in the brief period of time that we have been working with this project, uh, we have very rapidly come to understand that there are multiple levels of complexity, certainly associated with our project, but that generalize to many projects uh, that appear to impact on the ability to conduct a trial and even potentially on the results. And that's the information that we would uh, like to share with you. So this is over to me. I'm Connie Van Egan, and thank you also for letting me participate in your learning process. I'm excited to be here. Uh, this uh, overview is just what we hope to accomplish, what Roger and I hope to accomplish as part of the aims of this particular presentation. There are three elements that we think uh, lead to successful implementation of a research project. Um, there are some core elements that are the complex components. And the word complex was carefully cho chosen when something is complicated. That's like one of my teenagers saying, Mom, it's, it's, it's complicated. That usually means they don't want to tell me about it, but when I sit down and talk to them, they can string out in a rational process the issues that are bothering them. When something is complex, it defies predictability. It needs a team effort to sort out in a flexible, resilient, and responsive way what is happening. And that is a great way to describe what Roger and I learned. The complexity of the components contributes to overall project complexity, so same meaning of complexity there. And then we want to discuss what we've experienced in terms of managing uh, project complexity. So over back to you, Roger. So it's pretty clear through the work that Connie and I have been doing over the years that even though our initial focus was to fix things, most of what we have learned is, or much of what we have learned is, that the way one designs what one is going to do from the macro down to the micro level has a profound impact on facilitating, uh, enhancing, or limiting outcomes because design problems can really slow you down, as this little slide suggests to us. So we're now going to give you a bit of an overview of the trial, both in terms of its execution and timeline. Um, we should reiterate that we are on the very earliest stages of the trial. Literally, we just got a signed contract just after April 1, even though we got supported uh, in September. Uh, and we will explain some of the reasons for that time sequence. So, so uh, Mike? Please. I'm going with this one, Roger. Okay, yeah. complex study in all phases. Uh, the, the research process itself, as I'm sure you're aware, doesn't just spring out of nothing. It comes through a lot of hard work. And we've divided that hard work into a preparatory phase, which is, especially in the nature of a PCORI uh, project, uh, involves a lot of additional people besides researchers. So there's a pre preparatory activity, which we'll go into detail about. Then an application phase and a post-award phase. And Roger just indicated that post-award is not a small deal. It was a six-month process for us. So quite a long time when you add to that the application phase. And then early implementation phase, which is actually where we are right now. So across each one of those phases has some specific activities that are um, important. 
But in addition to those, there's some activities that kind of transcend all those phases. As we're working with um, changing groups of people, there is activity related to training and facilitation and data collection. And let me just give you a quick example of that. Uh, we discovered very quickly that we needed a communication method to connect all of our research team together as well as to um, connect ourselves with our um, stakeholder groups. And that by itself turned out to be something to explore. Every single method that we used had to be trialed. Folks had to be trained on the method. And we're just talking about how to stay in touch with each other and share documents and make sure that we were well informed about what other people thought and getting input on that. And then sometimes we needed to facilitate those groups, just like you facilitate a project improvement team or a study uh, design team. So facilitation activities, and then we're collecting data. Part of this whole project is to get feedback, not only from our subjects in the future as we participate in this, as we move the study along, but from our participants, the colleagues, the research uh, PIs, the um, co-investigators, the consultants, and most of all, the patients who are also engaged in this research activity. So complex. Breath and depth, and that's what we'll be talking about today. Go ahead, Roger. So the trial that we are focusing on is entitled the Integrated Behavioral Health and Primary Care Trial, and it is um, a 40-site pragmatic trial uh, designed to evaluate the impact of different ways of presenting behavioral care within the primary care setting and assess uh, what happens to a variety. If, if, if the way that the care is developed, uh, delivered, impacts upon the outcomes that are generated. A number of years ago, uh, uh, C.J. Peak and Russ Glasgow and myself and some others uh, critiqued some of the limitations of our traditional research model and suggested an alternative that we have labeled the five R's. And the five R's have served as a framework for how we think about the work that we are doing on our trial. That the work that is produced needs to be relevant to responding to questions that stakeholders have. Uh, one needs to be able to generate data and report on it rapidly. It needs to be rigorous, including robust and replication, and finding a balance between internal and external validity. It needs to respond to the resources necessary to be able to generate the interventions that are being uh, applied. And it needs to be recursive, iterative, and support ongoing learning. In the PCORI project, Another component that is uh, particularly relevant is the project is particularly patient-centered at all levels and includes patients engaged in uh, the development and execution uh, of the research by the research team. And that is resulting in the trial. The research question contrasts probably the highest frequency behavioral intervention in primary care, which is a co-location model, almost a private practice sitting within a corner of a primary care office, with an integrated into the primary care flow and system model where behavioral services become literal partners in and parts of the organization and delivery of medical care. And the focus is on 
a patient population that's multimorbid. And the outcomes that we are looking at relate to health status and medical outcomes primarily. So we want to compare uh, the care of, of practices that have co-located care. That's the model Roger just described where someone is perhaps sitting in a corner of the office but not, is not integrated in the office with practices that have fully integrated care. Or we want to see what happens when practices move through uh, sort of a scale of integration and go from wherever they are right now to someplace that would be represented as being more integrated. And so we had three aims to support that project. And the first one, no surprise here, I think, is that we're interested in what happens to the patient. So we're going to compare co-located practices and integrated behavioral health practices and see which one is better outcomes for patients. And we're not describing this study in great detail, but in this particular case, the uh, primary measure for this aim is patient reported outcomes uh, relative to their health status. Aim two looks at not now we've left patients in aim one. Aim two is looking at the practices. If there is a way to help practices integrate the behavioral health work completely, does a structured process help them successfully integrate? And in this case, the measure has to do with the degree of integration the practice has achieved, which is based on a 30-point um, uh, survey that they complete in different stages of the study. So AIM-1 is about the patient. AIM-2 is about the uh, structured process that helps practices become more integrated and how to measure that effectiveness. And AIM-3 has to do with really what I love, I love and breathe to work on, which is what helps practices more effectively change what they're doing at the level of operations. So we're exploring how different characteristics about the practice and the healthcare system that they're in influence how effectively they can become more integrated. And so part of our work is to do field work with those practices and understand how they're approaching this process, this complex process of becoming more integrated. Back to you, Roger. So a point that I would just like to uh, underscore is that I imagine that you all have uh, received and hopefully reviewed a brief overview of the project. Uh, so we're not going to necessarily get into a lot of depth about the project, but that's not really what the presentation is about. The, pro the presentation is about our experiences with the multiplicity of issues that have evolved uh, from that. So the breadth of uh, involvement of practices is, um, as in many of the cases, uh, East Coast, uh, less so in the middle and uh, significant representation uh, in the West. Uh, we pre-recruited the 40 practices involved. Uh, and the uh, <coughs> each practice is part of a cluster of practices in a particular region. And the cluster of practices is under the responsibility of a cluster investigator that uh, makes sure that all that needs to be get done is getting done. And those cluster investigators report to me who have overall responsibility for the practice recruitment and the execution within the practice. And, um, and the, the, the final point I want to make about it is that I, I kind of had this thought that that was a good idea as we were putting this together. But as we are unfolding the sets of activities and requests and requirements that are necessary to get accomplished, uh, I could not possibly have undertaken the multiple complexities of just managing practices without the, I believe it's 10 
senior collaborators who are taking on the responsibilities of the practice. Connie? Yes. Um, so, so when we you think back at those that range of sites across the country, think also about the fact that this is a funder who is also particip participating in the science of the study. So we have PCORI, which is an institute that cares greatly about the engagement of patients and research so that the work that is done is centered around patients' needs. It's completely understandable. Their funding responsibility, though, doesn't give them the ability to provide grants. They provide contracts. And those contracts get uh, come with a set of milestones and specific deliverables that happen at least once a quarter, if not more often, for the five-year period that we have this contract. The funder is also a participant. And for that reason, the, what Roger is describing as the cluster PIs or the cluster principal investigators help us stay absolutely on top of what the sites are going to be doing and their coordination with the research team about achieving those milestones and coming up with those deliverables. So what's an example milestone? Uh, well, one milestone, because this is the quarry, for example, is that there will be quarterly stakeholder meetings. And not only will there be quarterly stakeholder meetings, but those meetings will include a self-evaluation process in which we scrutinize whether or not the process we're using is patient-centered and whether we are successfully engaging patients in the process of doing research. And then there's documentation of the deliverable parts that supports that. Throughout the five-year study, the funder also intends to do site visits, not only with the research team, but with the study sites as well. And again, the cluster PIs are a really important resource to help make sure that study sites are not overwhelmed and that the management of those visits doesn't interfere with either the practice of providing care to patients as well as the ability of the um, clinical site to, to participate effectively in the uh, research study. This was even more complicated by um, post-award, remember the award was September of 2015, um, that the funder requested some changes, and we're going to talk about those changes in a minute. But the changes that they asked um, made significant changes to the design of the study. Okay, this is not a small item, is how your study is designed. The sample size to support um, appropriate level, you know, um, power for understanding the results of your study and managing the intervention itself. So a piece of work to help the funder participate in the science of the study and coordinate that across the cluster PIs that we're helping support the clinical sites and their understanding of what they're getting involved in. So we have a question for you. Uh, uh, Roger, go ahead. I'm ready for the next slide. I was, you are, though. Going to tell, I was just going to tell the relatively amusing story of the way you really find out that you're funded from Corey is you sit around and look at a monitor in which they are having a board meeting. And then they kind of flip over a card that announces who got funded and also the amount of the funding. So we kind of knew that we were going to get funded via an email the day before. But when it came up, we noticed that the amount of the award was almost 50% greater than what we had requested. And the response from us was, oh, there must have been a typo. And what we later found out was, no, there was no typo. It was, as Connie had suggested, uh, that despite them really liking a lot about their project, they were going to insist on alteration of the fundamental design and the alteration that they proposed was going to cost considerably more money. So they added that amount of money and then subsequently in conversations with them, they said, um, yeah, that's why we did it and this is what we want you to do. So I can now in retrospect chuckle about that. I didn't at the time. So now think about this. This is this is your opportunity to say, okay, so what's my opinion about this? 
Um, we're asking you to use the chat uh, window uh, to, to answer this question. You've got to study. You've just been you've been lining up 40, you know, a set of practices. At that time, it was only 30 practices in order to be able to support your application. So 30 practices and all their people and all the cluster PIs have like cottoned into this. They've supported your application, and we're all saying so. Oh, great! We're going to get awarded on you know support. So the question is, is what are some of the possible negative consequences of changing the intervention? After initial recruitment to get clinical sites signed up for the application. So what would you think about that? I'm going to give you a few seconds. Um, I have to tell you while you're thinking about that that something happened to my Blackboard Collaborate window and I can't actually see your responses. So I'm going to ask Roger follow on this. Yes. So yeah. we'll go back over to Roger to um, first the and asked if they changed the amount of the funding for the award or the structure. They changed the total award amount because they anticipated they were going to insist on changes in the structure. So Kara suggested getting everyone on board with changes. And that's a lot of people to get on board with very, very significant changes that impacted at the practice level, at the organization level. Um, sites dropping out, uh, Deepak suggested that, and we've been very fortunate thus far that we've had uh, very minimal dropout from those um, that have had, uh, that have suggested that they wanted to play. I mean, the future is still before us, and we'll see but um, there are a number of you who made the comment about uh, the issue of dropping out. A bit of a bait and switch feel. Oh, uh, Andrew mentioned that, and I, I really don't even want to go there. I, they're not bad people, and they didn't have any malice intended in what they were doing. It was more of a big surprise that we had a scurry around. Um, yeah, and who is this? Anne suggested concerns that uh, they then will impact on the project uh, through the funding period. And that's absolutely accurate uh, of a concern, and it's also accurate in what the experiences were. Um, uh, there's a comment by Sebastian that this doesn't feel very patient-centered or practice-centered a way for them to be operating, and um, I understand that. Um, and we are right now in the middle of finding out uh, how practices are going to be able to take on the multiple responsibilities. Uh, the delay in the timeline, excellent point, Andrew. Um, uh, just because we just got funded April 1st does not necessarily change the expectation of when we are going to generate product for them. Uh, so that's definitely also a concern. And that's everything that was there, Connie. Okay, thanks. Great answers. Um, and you'll see them mostly reflected on the next slide as well. So good job sort of walking in our shoes with us. Um, possible consequences? Absolutely, incentive to participate may be reduced. I signed up for this, but you're giving me that. And the this for that is pretty significant, as I'll describe in a slide or two. Um, another piece is that co-investigators and consultants get caught in the middle. Uh, people are doing the best they can to try to understand and explain and share with other groups of people. And, and the people at the far end, you know, delays and improvement will cause frustration. They get frustrated and they push that by line. And the co-investigators and consultants feel like, well, we're not responsible for this. And they let us know that, you know, the research team, you know, needs to do more to help the funder um, explain what's happening and, and stay on time. So there's this, you know, as in any, any chain of communication, the more chains you have in the links, links you have in the process, the messier the communication can get. And this is probably our first heads up that you know, folks, 
we need to have a really good communication method. We need to have a system that is not only functionally supportive but also really respectful because everybody is trying their hardest to do this well. And, uh, and of course, we, no one's done this particular trial before. And it doesn't sound like many people have done this particular funded contract before in exactly this way. So we need to be really good at this. Um, and we need to learn quickly. So that was our first beginning to understand the degree to which we needed to have a process to support this kind of complex, uh, you know, many people involved, many cooks, you know, stirring the soup and making sure that everybody kind of floats to the top and feels like they're supported. So those are um, great examples. So, so um, I, let's I, go, go ahead. I don't know if we have this on the slide, but for example, our core team at the University of Vermont has plus or minus eight people on it. Um, in addition, we have another six or seven co-investigators. Uh, we have nine or ten cluster principal investigators, and we have an advisory board of plus or minus 15 people. So the magnitude, again, of the complexity of the task of uh, managing that communication uh, certainly can get messy, particularly if it's left in my hand, um, which is it's not a content area that I'm terribly skilled at, most fortunately, our um, uh, PI, Ben Littenberg, and Connie Van Eden are very excellent at this. And um, it's a very active, time-consuming process. True that. Um, next, on to the next slide, Roger. This was a, um, this is sort of like a quick description of, so how complicated was this really? When PCORI set up its original announcement, one of the things they did was they uh, apparently warmly invited uh, the design approach called a stepped wedge. I'm not sure how familiar you are with that, and I'm not going to provide a lecture on that, I promise. But essentially, what a stepped wedge allows you to do is allows you to take your subject, and in this case, think of the subjects as being practices. And it allows you to um, moder modulate the uh, introduction of the intervention over time at different times for different practices. That way, each practice serves its own control. Before it gets its intervention, it's in the control group. After it gets its intervention, it's in the intervention group. This is efficient. It means that you don't need large numbers in order to do this kind of, a, this kind of analysis. And it's less expensive. However, there is a possible criticism about step wedge, which is that if you have a secular change taking place, if, for example, many practices are already engaged in looking at integrated behavioral health, and their delay in getting intervention means that they will potentially get introduced to that concept or operationalize it themselves before they get to the intervention, then clearly your results are going to be biased. So, so although this was a supported and even welcomed approach, Macquarie has several stages that we'll talk to you about in a couple of slides of review there. And one of those levels of review is called the science review. And the scientists in that review rejected our stepped wedge design. Now, what was interesting about our experience, and Rogers alluded to this too, is that Pakori really liked our study. In other words, they really liked the topic. And instead of denying us and saying, ah, now try again around the next round, they decided to say, we could find you, but you're ha would you be willing to make some changes? OK, someone says, we'll find you, but you have to make some changes. What do you say? You know, no, I'll let you know tomorrow. It's like, wow. <laughs> so so uh, we said, sure, what do you want? And it turned out that what they wanted was a standard randomized controlled trial with some practices in the intervention group and some practices in the control group. OK, so think back to what we've just told all our clinical sites. You're in stick wedge. You're going to get the intervention, right? Everybody gets the intervention under step wedge. Randomized control trial, not so much. Half will, half won't. So there was a good bit of negotiation around this. And to get to the bottom of this particular story, 
uh, the reason that um, we came back with a successful proposal post this request was because we asked, we, we said to Pecori, we have to ultimately give everybody the intervention. The, the, and, and the controls, the size of the whole sample had to go up, and that was part of the expense. But we also had to ultimately provide, at the end of the whole study period, we had to provide an intervention to everyone. And that's not inexpensive. It's quite a uh, resource-packed um, intervention. So that was a key to it. That makes sense, Roger? Did I explain that well? Yes, and interestingly, Anne made that same point in a comment that the step west design helps engage practices because everybody gets yes. better from the intervention. And we had to come up with a, a bit of a tricky workaround to that such that over the same period of time of the project, um, we needed to be able to turn the control sites on at some point to become uh, able to take advantage of the intervention. Over to you, Roger. So, I've already mentioned this actually. There's a lot to coordinate just at our own site level, let alone with the myriad of other people that I have. Uh, uh, just laid out. Roger, could you um, go back two slides? I think we skipped timeline. I might have. One more. One more. Oh, thank you. I did. So we found out in September 15, in September 15, that we were going to be able to uh, be supported. Um, and then there were multiple other reviews subsequent to that um, that caused us between September and January of 2016 to make changes in the design and how we were going to use the resources. And then from January 15th through March to uh, uh, 2016, we were in negotiations about the key milestones and timelines, the specific deliverables, and issues related to the budget. Anything more about that, Connie? No, that's good. So the next one is about interactions. Um, hang on, I'll wait for the slide to catch up. Does the slide caught up? Yeah, okay. at least I can see it now. So <laughs> thanks. Um, so interactions. So so we're talking about changes, and you know that when you're making changes, change requires time. And um, and this is just a real brief slide. So you're not talking changes within the research team. Roger explained the research team was about eight people, um, most of whom are on UVM campus, but in different departments and, and colleges and stuff like that. There's a variety of co-investigators. There was about six that Roger identified. And then there are also consultant specialists in particular areas who are working with us to support certain parts of the intervention uh, to make it fit this particular trial. And then there's patient advisors, which include members of the research team who are patients. So some of our patient advisors are actually patient research investigators, and I should have mentioned them in the first stop. They're part of the research team, um, but there, and there are three of them. They're not on campus, but they're closely connected with us. And then there is a host of patient advisors that went through the process of developing this whole proposal, going through the whole um, award process and post-award process, and then working with us on implementing or initiating the, the trial. And then there's other stakeholders in addition to that. So I won't try to break all of that down. I'm just saying, you know, when we talk about change requires time, when you're talking about multi-level trials with many different kinds of participants, we're talking about a lot of time. Go ahead, Roger. And this one, so let me let me talk about this one. This is sort of like my bailiwick in a way is engaging patients in quality improvements, engaging patients in designing their care. Um, this is work I do in other parts of my life. And this whole process has taught me that before you start anything, you have to have a 
a, a nice period of time where you simply can say, what does this mean and how do we do this? So before we started writing this application for this grant, we had a preparatory process where we began to identify the people who would be involved, what their roles would be, and what function they would have in terms of helping us just design the study and write an application. So this isn't, you know, a couple of people, you know, gathered around a conference table saying, oh, let's do like a grant application and let's get that in on, you know, in a month. This is many months of identifying the people. Remember, this is a this is a project around behavioral health care of multiply comorbid patients. Patients that have heart issues and also have behavioral health issues. Or they have diabetes and they have health behavior issues. So whatever. So we're looking for participants who are going to help us really understand what is important about our project from the patient perspective, and we're doing that before we even have our research question figured out. So we're kind of feeling around. You know, we're trying to like not exactly grope in the dark because we think we know what's important, but we absolutely have to bring folks along with us every step of the way, or else it's it's not a legitimately patient-centered, engaged process. It has to have that piece to it. And when you prepare this activity, it is kind of the opposite of what, think about the Nike sneaker ads from like, I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago, whenever it was. They would say, just do it, you know? You, you have a simple process. You put on your sneakers, you get on the road, you just do it. That is great when it's a simple process. If you're talking about a complex process, that's not the best way to get started. You really do think pretty carefully about what is the input that you want from each of these different people, how will they provide it, how will they give feedback, and how will they help us with the next step. So the next step in this case was recruitment. Roger talked about the fact that not only were we looking for clinical sites, there were clusters of clinical sites, and for those clusters we were looking for um, PIs who could help manage those clusters and make sure that we connected with them effectively. So there are you know, tasks upon tasks in this particular phase, but I think you get the particular idea that this is about collaborating with stakeholders, having a functional communication Connie? process, and getting participation. Connie? Can you come up on that, Roger? Yeah, I want to quickly mention that Macquarie apparently has a lot of money, and many people out in the research world are looking to try to draw some of that money down and to generate projects. I don't, I can't really count, um, it's probably over 10, the number of communications that I've gotten from potential investigators that have said, um, oh, we're going to apply for a Cory grant and we've got it all done and now we have to figure out how to, you know, put a, a patient involvement component together. Um, and that's not a Cory's model. Uh, let me reiterate that we're talking about from the point in time that we sat down and had an idea about this project. We involved patients at all phases. And um, so the ideas, the definitions, the measurement, the design were all issues that not only the patients participated, but uh, in fact significantly influenced um, and to help shift numbers of our ideas. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Hi, uh, this is Vladimir. I, I don't know if you were able to uh, read the chat, but uh, we have a question from Anne. Um, how long before um, the grant was due did you start on this process? Oh, boy. It was over, it was over a year. It was over a year. So that, that's a minimalist. That's a minimalist response. So. I, I don't know if Kara Stevens is on the call. She's a good colleague of mine. And we had, uh, ever since Corey put out an announcement that said um, that the issue of behavioral health integration was priority of ours, uh, Carrie and I have been having multiple conversations about how do we put something like this together. Um, so while it was a, a year prior to uh, it was more than a year prior to the first submission because there were multiple months preparing a letter of intent, and then we had to modify the letter of intent prior to the application. Uh, so all told, there were at least a couple plus years 
prior to the application being submitted. Thank you for that question. This is a good question. Um, we had a question for you, but Roger, I'm looking at the time, and I, I know we wanted to save time for folks to ask their own questions. So I'm counting should we wide. Um, so I think we're we're on track to be done by about ten after one. Okay. All right. So give us your thoughts then, and and then I'm going with ahead of this question. Um, so we just talked about the idea that there's a preparatory process. The phase one is all about preparation. You think about yourself doing a research project, um, and you're you know sort of a little bit about what this particular research question is, is about, and you're trying to engage clinical sites. What do you think are some of the things that they really need to know about? So give us your answers in chat, and I'll let Roger moderate that. I, I have no problem reading the, um, the chat, Roger, uh, Dr. Kessler. That's fine. Thank you. That'd be great. I appreciate it. So if you were thinking, of, if you were a site thinking about signing up, what do you want to know? So we have some people typing now. So just uh, give okay, me great. Okay, um, so some of the responses are uh, from Andrew. Uh, what uh, what do I have to commit to? Um, how will it affect the? Uh, sorry, what do I have to commit to? How will it affect integration efforts I'm already making? Um, we also have from. I'm not sure if you want to stop for every question, or just would you like me to go through? Why don't you go through them? Okay. Um, Jinping has um, how much time does it require? Uh, Deepak, um, how will how will the project affect patient care and workflow for the practice? Uh, from Anne, will I have uh, adequate financial and human capital support to implement goals of the project? Um, here again, human resources and expert expertise, um, and also from um, Jin. Jinping, uh, will it interfere in our patient flow? And lastly, what happens to those services when study uh, when when study period is over? Great questions. So, let me go back a little. I'm going up the questions now. Um, those are great questions, and many of them were exactly the questions that um, we were juggling with. Um, so part of what we're doing is trying to be as explicit. Well, let me step back. So those co-PIs are essentially clinicians who work in primary care practice. And we're hypersensitive to the intrusion of change. Uh, so uh, 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 um, a tenet of what we're trying to do is craft a way of uh, generating the project that was able to be done in regular on the ground primary care, the amount of time, the amount of resources. Um, the care and workflow is uh, stuff that it shouldn't have a direct, it shouldn't have a, a concerning effect on patient care other than to potentially identify sets of patients who are not receiving a certain amount or type of services that may well be able to uh, moving forward. Uh, it, we designed the project to minimize uh, the effect on uh, workflow. Uh, we are trying to uh, adequately fund both the direct and indirect cost of the intervention, uh, and again, um, we're trying to come up with a design 
that minimally intrudes on human capital. One of the requirements of our project, for example, is to participate or practice must already have at least a 0.5 FTE behavioral health clinician. So we were not saying, hey, go out there and do something that you're not doing, um, but rather um, trying to use the existing resource. Uh, it's non-simple. There are, in fact, time demands. Uh, but we're trying to pay attention to that as best, um, as best we can. We do not see that it will interfere with patient flow, although that's a great question. And part of what we are trying to do is impact on operations and infrastructure so that when the study period is over, what you have done is modified the way that you do practice. The, the Cori dollars cannot pay for clinical services in any kind of way. So all of the dollars are involved in the research activity and um, uh, supporting the practice to engage in the intervention that will result in the practice changes. And I think that's all of them that are here. OK, so next slide, Roger. So you got it. Um, you know, if you look at, you know, I kind of loosely categorized responses in four groups. Um, the first one was being in the intervention. You know, why are we doing this? You know, what's going to happen to our patients? What's in it for our patients? Why should we bother? So that's a category of questions. And we actually wrote up project descriptions, recruitment information, um, FAQs about how is this going to affect different people, not only the patients, but secondarily, the cost and the benefit of the practice, what's in it for us. Um, and a lot of the questions that you raised are just about that. We have to stay a viable practice. We have to be able to maintain this afterwards. We have to understand what's really taking place and what we're required to do and what it's going to cost us. So those are two really key issues. Because, however, the intervention requires the engagement of their patients, a couple of patients, in their intervention process. They are going to be redesigning their care so that it better integrates behavioral health from the degree of co-location that they have to a higher level of integration. The um, intervention requires them to engage the patients in their redesign team. They have to actually ask patients to participate. There were other questions that were raised not only about that level of interaction, but also the fact that we were going to be asking their patients for their health outcomes on telephone interviews that the practices wouldn't know about. So everything that touches on HIPAA issues, what are the rules about doing that? What are the risks? Is it safe? Understanding that there are differences state by state, as well as federal regulations, is also a really key issue for clinical sites. And then there's the basic, well, what if we don't get put in the intervention arm? You know, what if my kid doesn't get crushed? You know, that's what we used to say when I was younger. Um, what, if, what if I don't wind up in the place in the study? How are people going to take care of my needs? And that whole responsiveness to the individual clinical site, they're, they're a unique clinical site. How will you help us make sure that we are taken care of? Um, is just an overall overarching responsibility and key issue that they have a voice, we will listen, they have clinical PIs, we will be responsive, and so forth, um, is an important key issue for the clinical site. Anything more on that, Roger? No, we have 12 yes. minutes to get through about 10 to 12. Yes, go for it. So the, the, the purpose of listing, oh, sorry, the purpose of listing these things is again to reiterate the numbers of multiple processes. Oh, okay. I mean, that's fine. And what do I have to do? Just go right here and make. I'm sorry. I do see that. Go up to the cube. Oh, okay. I couldn't see how to get to. So somebody on un somebody unmuted. As a reminder, can everyone please mute? Thank you. So what we see here are, again, the multiple issues just in this early startup phase, post-award to startup, 
that we all have to get resolved. So, for example, we have 40 practices having to deal with um, IRB issues. My goodness, that's uh, a challenge that we're going to work through. Um, another one I'll point to is the data required, both from the practices and from sample patients, uh, is going to require data extraction. And um, while we have a wonderful resource in Wilson Pace who is managing that work, that's just an, an entire set of activities and time um, that has to be the case. In the training component of the intervention, uh, there are 70 different training modules that we will be generating for the entire primary care team. And we are currently in the process of working with subcontractors from Arizona State and University of Massachusetts uh, to generate the content, presentation, and technology of that delivery. Um, and at the, the universe just operates the way that it does. Uh, Oregon, uh, our colleagues in Oregon, uh, identified a practice who is engaged in another project with the state. And the question was, we want to participate in this project, but does the participation with the state uh, limit our opportunity to do that? And so that conversation and sets of discussions and identifying what the um, in criteria or out criteria are is just another unanticipated twist of which there are and will continue to be many. Right. So, uh, early question. implementation. Um, okay. Um, is there a separate IRB for each cluster and collaborator, or one overseeing IRB who will approve the project? Boy, wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> um, there, there is the potential, technically, of an overseeing IRB, um, but many of the sites are part of clustered organizations. That is, a single organization is responsible for N, and N is usually three to six sites, uh, numbers of practices, and in that scenario, a single IRV application might be able to cover all of the others uh, in their cluster. Uh, there are, however, certain sets of practices that are essentially freestanding practices. They are not organizationally linked, and they are going to have to generate their own IRV approval. So uh, again, what we're reiterating and reiterating is each of these pieces has multiple subtasks that have their own levels of complexity associated with them. And if we don't do them right, um, then it's going to get muddier and muddier and impact on the um, ability to mount and uh, uh, generate appropriate rigor for uh, the trial. So it's a study process, like any study process. There is a recruitment stage, an intervention stage. You evaluate your report. But for each one of those stages, what we've realized is that we have the same support process, the same phases we have to go through. We have to prepare. We have to collaborate. We have to communicate across all of those people that we were talking about previously. So this isn't an you know this isn't an explanation of what those processes are because you know what those are. This is a reality test that for every single one of those activities you need to prepare, collaborate, and communicate in the same way. Go ahead, Roger. So for example, just when we're talking about recruitment, just because somebody is saying I want to play um, does not mean that they've met the pieces of the criterion that have been established for eligibility to participate. So just to continue on to the point where we can say, yes, you exist within the parameters that are sufficient for you to participate in the trial is 
certainly a multiple week at least activity and um, has expectations from the package, from the uh, cluster PI, et cetera. So, um, go ahead. I'm sorry? Go ahead, Roger. So, uh, we're just now going to kind of summarize some of the key organizational points related to the complex the experience that we've had in terms of the complexity of conducting a trial. Connie. Well, this is a quote from Hannah in 1988. Uh, many others have picked it up, Paul Vitalman and Don Berwick. And it essentially says that, you know, every system gets is designed to get the results it gets. If you want different results, you need to improve the design of the system. As true as that is of healthcare delivery, that is equally true of a research process. If we want to get different results, we have to use process change in order to improve that. So go ahead, Roger. We've just been saying over and over again that there are multiple process steps, and each of the steps has their own multiple points that have a certain degree of complexity and multiple choices associated with it. And the choices that are made um, have unique consequences at the core level, at the cluster level, and at, at the site. Um, patient engagement is endemic to the process as it moves forward. And I think that while this is generally noted as a core phenomena at the moment, um, more and more multiple funders are going to uh, adopt that construct. Uh, as Connie said so well, the communication and engagement is crucial. Uh, and as tedious as it may be, uh, it is a critical element of being able to effectively move forward. And interphase assessment of communication, um, the better you get at it, the more that you can make the micro adjustments that are necessary. Uh, for transparent decision making. Connie? This one's yours, Roger. Aha. So what does that mean, all those words I just said about effective communication and engagement? So in the projects that you're involved in or thinking about being involved in, what are the characteristics of effective communication and engagement with the multiple sets of people that you have to be dealing with? Thoughts? For some people typing? Yes, we got a few uh, a few uh, participants Great. typing. So. Great. Thank you. So Sebastian says, active listening, helping overcome hierarchical barriers, engaging from beginning of the project. Andrew says, asking the right questions, checking in as a listener. Alex says, it's a big question. Anne says, frequency, reliability, trust, building, honesty, responsiveness. We have mutual respect from Deepak. Kara Birch says, listening. Andrew Riley says, transparency. Mary says, so let's go to the next slide. Oh, we've got a, we've got a couple oh, more in the bottom there, too. Go for it. Respect communication structure, when, what, how, yep. ability to ultimately have people comfortable that opinions are valued and heard, uh, shared priorities, allow for self-discovery, not just following a cookbook. 
Excellent. So, my comment on that is, or my comment on that is, I don't want to do that stuff. I just want to do research. And I'm wrong. Uh, this is not a process that can be either neglected or minimized. Um, as the questions, obviously, to who have good experience in that, this area are um, are finding out. Uh, so where am I? Okay, I get it. Couple more. I, Yep, move the slide forward. You went backwards by accident. Put it up, put up chat boxes. There you go. Stay right there. Okay. So one of our uh, collaborators um, is uh, a person who thinks about how do you engage practices in the work of research quite a lot. The chat box has, in fact, come up with a structured communication approach. And those categories encompass the things that were, were listed out. And um, I draw closer diagram connection to those if I could. Um, so but let me just go through this particular structure. What is expected? What do you want me to do? Exactly what am I supposed to do? That's one level of communication. Who is supposed to do it? Who is taking the responsibility? Is this you? Is this me? Is it, you know, am I a participant? Am I leading it? What exactly is the level of responsibility that I have, and then what is that responsibility? How do we define what it is specifically that I'm supposed to get done? What kind of help is available? Is the research team able to help? Is there money for this? What, 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 do I, what do I look to in terms of understanding and carrying out this activity? And then this is the last one um, echoes what was said several times from the chat group. How will we ensure the process includes shared mutual respect? What we did is we came up with a document that used that structure to illustrate every single thing we were asking the clinical sites to do. So that as clearly as possible, and simply as a starting point for a conversation, we could say, for example, if you would like to be engaged in this trial, here's what would be expected of you. And we took a messy five-point doc document with many, many points on it, and we reorganized it, and they all collapsed into these five different categories. So that was one way of responding. But what everybody read out, uh, what, was, what was in the chat, is exactly on target, and I think you all understand this well. Go ahead, Roger. So it's all about the culture that is determined by all the points that you folks have just been making and responding to Jeff's observation. Uh, inclusiveness has to be the case all along the entire process of development and execution of your work. Clear documentation so people can see um, decisions that have been made, ideas that are going to be determined, um, uh, interpretations of uh, things that have happened, surveys and structured methods to identify and reduce barrier, active engagement in the norms of the group at any level, and as that last point, a commitment to listen and respect alternatives and uh, open honest communication. Um, I, let me stay with that one more, one more, one more comment, Roger. If you go back to that slide. This process, culture derived process, these activities that we identified as helping define our culture were in our application. We didn't invent this after the application was created. It had to be invented as part of that long process of preparation because it was clear to us that these elements of being able to stay connected, communicative, supportive, collaborative had to involve functions that we could point to and say, this is how we'll get that done. That was included in our application. In fact, the court even offers a, a, a structured element called the engagement plan. And we describe this process in quite a bit of detail using these points. So this is not a small thing. This is a big thing. And it deserves all the same kind of preparation and collaborative support that all the other steps in the research project do. Go ahead, Roger. So the trial that we're doing is a pretty big uh, trial with a large number of practices. 
But the issues that we we suggest that the issues that we're presenting today, um, size certainly affects those issues, but the issues are endemic and are present regardless of the size and the number of sites. Um, the, the cultural issues are always present. Um, much of our work has been observing places that have uh, attempted to integration by using a just do it model and um, watching those efforts have limited impact and in many cases uh, fail. The outcomes are more than just the aims of the study. It's about the team, the stakeholder feedback, and figuring out a way to manage the expectations of the funder. Roger and, and Connie. I was going to say Mary has a Mary had a question from uh, Mary Delansky from Cleveland was asking if you labeled that culture section. Did you specifically label culture in the grant? We labeled it engagement. It was, it was a it, it there's sort of a PCORI vocabulary which you get used to as you read their request for proposals. And we called this our engagement plan. Thank you. Roger? So, so Roger uh, and Connie, do uh, you have additional slides? Chris LJ. No, we're done now. Well, I really want to thank you uh, for a dynamite presentation. I want to thank Dr. Kessler and Dr. Van Egan to do a deep dive into a project that is essentially a, a tiger by the tail. Uh, and I think this allows us to uh, get a pretty good idea of what we need to do uh, with our uh, projects. I, I kept writing down questions, but then your next slide addressed the question. I couldn't get ahead of you. Uh, and so we're going to, uh, in a minute, take a few more uh, questions, but I, I have a uh, the, the, the webinar message that I need to relay is that uh, uh, I think we've learned a lot that today from today's webinar. The conclusion of the webinar, uh, we really need your feedback. Uh, so uh, there's the uh, the survey because it really allows us to uh, to format uh, future webinars to uh, to meet your needs and uh, uh, we de-identify the the feedback, but it's essential. Uh, for the certification uh, program, and so you know, let um, Amanda, Jim, or LJ know uh, uh, if you've got some things. And uh, just uh, wanted to, uh, to to open it up for questions uh, uh, to to close out for over the next five minutes, and then we'll 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 finish a little bit early. Somebody had asked if this is our first PCORI application, and I was going to be a bit snarky and say uh, this is our first and last PCORI application, um, but that doesn't appear to be the fact, but, it, but this one is our first. Wow. Yeah, and you didn't start small, so you started really, really big, and you've had a number of surprises along the way, and, it's, and so your ability to, to deal with the surprises and and pain seems to be pretty good. So what is it about uh, your research team that allows you uh, to be fairly nimble and adaptable? Connie? Well, I, I, I think it's the same as for any team. It isn't just a research team. Um, teams are functional in that they have a common goal. They have specific, uh, they're oriented towards a specific and usually quick timeline. They have um, things that they do that are different but are highly interconnected with each other and they require mutual support. Um, that's a recipe for any good team and that is equally true for this one. Roger? So I, I don't know how to come up with the right words for this. Um, the uh, PI and co-PI on this um, are not folks who have easily existed within 
the multiple elements of the academic system. And because of that, I think it's created the need to be to have to be able to be consistently flexible and light on your feet in responding to situations that come up. And I can't speak for other research teams, um, but we anticipate from the beginning. We anticipated that there is chaos in the universe and it will visit us. And so the part about being surprised and shocked um, by when it does happen is when it's more limited than other situations that, that I've seen or been part of. So uh, someone asked us the question of, uh, about this slide that's up now, the culture drives process. Um, and um, group norms. They're asking about what are the group norms that we review regularly and how do we implement that? Connie? The, okay, so a group norm is um, a set of agreed upon behaviors that a collection of people say, yep, that's how they behave. Now, there are group norms that are implicit that people don't talk about unless you ask them to talk about them. And what I do when I work with teams, because I am a guide in the world quality improvement facilitator, is I start uh, groups of people to become good functional teams by talking about group norms. What's okay and what's not okay? Is it okay to have a team meeting and not have everybody present? Um, is it okay to be interrupted in the middle of team meeting and leave because something else has come up that's more important? Um, if one of those things happen, what's our way of following up with each other and making sure that someone who isn't present is still as responsible and held as accountable uh, for work that the team is doing as anybody who is present for that meeting? So those are a couple of examples. Uh, when you raise the question of a group norm up and you have that conversation ahead of time, then the potential for team conflict from misunderstanding, from making assumptions about each other and what you thought, you know, you know, you thought you would do and what I thought that meant and, and how I interpreted that and then what happened as a result, all that kind of stuff. Um, all of that, if it doesn't go away, what's important is it becomes discussable. You have a way of having a conversation about your team members' behaviors because you have these group norms. And when you review them regularly, you get to say, oh, are we doing that? Or has our group norm changed? And then let's have a conversation about that. Without having that early conversation, it's really hard to address issues that, that rise up. Roger? No, I don't have anything further to say about that. So, so what I'm hearing is there, uh, the conversation is incredibly important. I think uh, Anne Gagliotta uh, mentioned that uh, uh, primary care physicians get the relational piece. That's why they make good good researchers in the, uh, the, the primary care world. So I'm trying to remember, do you, I think you, do you have 10 clusters and 40 sites? Is that? Uh, uh, I believe that 10 is an accurate number, and certainly 40 is an accurate number. So do you have like 40 different cultures, or you know, how do you deal with the culture piece? Uh, Don't know uh, yet. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's so we're we're going to learn a lot more from uh, what you're doing. I wanted to make sure that everybody got their questions answered uh, here. Are there other questions that we didn't get to? And, and yes, Roger, uh, please, please. We have two more down at the bottom. Uh, Mary was wondering how we can access the toolkit uh, that Dr. Van Egan has published. And then Anne is wondering, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'll just slip this one in there too. Connie, is your discipline organizational behavior or another discipline? Just thinking about how I would go about seeking local folks to work with with your type of skill set. Okay, so let's do um, the last one first, which is I have um, um, my Master's in Business Administration with Organizational Behavior and Development. Um, it was also computer information systems. Um, just so you know, the technical side is as important as the uh, inter interpersonal side. And from there, I went on and completed a health services master's, and then I completed a doctorate in public health. Um, and all I can say is, 
this is a it, it's a complex topic. You want folks that understand how people interact with each other as well as how organizations themselves interact with the people that are inside them. And those are very useful um, domains to pay attention to as you're working in uh, a fairly complex research setting. Um, the toolkit is <laughs> a kind of complicated thing to share. I do have a document that I can share. I have not published it. I haven't published it because as the Bacori trial has proceeded and as some of the rules have changed, I've been adapting the toolkit to the new uh, population that it's supposed to support. If you go back and remember that my interest is in lean management, which comes out of the Toyota production system, it may be odd to be talking about car assembly, but it really does help. Um, what everything is organized around is the customer. So the customer of a car is a driver or the passengers, I understand that. The customer of our research are the patients who are involved, the subjects who are helping those patients, the practices, the providers and the staff, and all of the co-investigator stakeholders, research, and the funder who is responsible for making that work. So this toolkit is a redesign, is partly a redesign to be able to say, what is it that this particular group needs? And that's currently being, in a sense, repurposed. However, there is a previous toolkit that we used for our prior um, uh, uh, RO3 based funded by NIMH um, that created the basis of the study. And I can, uh, I can share that um, in a way that perhaps Amanda Ross or someone else can help me figure it out. Roger? Uh, that sounds reasonable to me. So and this is I'd be happy to help you do will that. Be establishing, we will be establishing a, a blog or our website shortly uh, for the project, and we'll distribute that to the group as soon as that's operational to those of you who are interested in following the project. And of course, if this uh, presentation has generated any thoughts, um, or ideas that you might have about your own work or any way that we might be able to assist, um, please get in contact with us uh, by email. And um, I'm seeing that we're getting very close to 1.30. Are there any last questions that folks might have? Well, so not. we're going we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna close out uh, here. I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Kessler and Dr. Van Egan for uh, uh, a, a great webinar. We're going to look forward to continuing to learn from you because I think there are lots more lessons that you're going to find uh, out there that, that we need to hear about. So uh, thank you. Please provide your feedback and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Everyone have a great day. Bye.